Welcome back to the Young Shakespeare Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Bill Von Hippel. He is an expert on evolution and social psychology. Bill, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Dan. I was wondering, you know, you have your book, The Social Leap, which um, I read just recently. It was fantastic. And it takes us through the story of how we got to be the way that we are. And there's a lot of really interesting pieces of evolution for us. One thing that I was really interested to learn more about was the ways in which evolutionary traits that would have been beneficial in the past are still impactful today. Obviously, my ability versus your ability to kill a lion might not be as important for gaining social status, but are there things that are still very impactful? Yeah, so you know, if you think about the history of our species, Homo sapiens has been around for two to 300,000 years. And during 90% of that time, we're hunter-gatherers. And so we're living in small bands out in the savanna, um, trying to kill things today that we're going to eat tonight. Mm -hmm. And so the last 10%, or even less, really, I mean, it's only, it's more like 5% has agriculture in it, has, and then the last, you know, 1% has cities in it. So the the kinds of ways that we make a living now are completely foreign to our ancestors. The kinds of worlds that we live in now are completely foreign to them. And so most of our, the, the things that make us happy and the um, things that scare us and the things that excite us, they're, they're relics of the past. Now we're really flexible species. And so we apply them to our modern world, but we still care about things that that we would regard as an evolutionary mismatch. You know, we're worried about things that aren't that aren't going to hurt us anymore, and we're not worried about things that would. So, for example, if you try to um, condition people to be afraid of a cockroach or a snake or a spider, it's really easy. Mm. Very quickly, they'll learn, ooh, that's gross, and I'm afraid of that. If you try to condition them to be afraid of a car or an electric outlet, it's very difficult, <laughs> even though cars and electric outlets are far more likely to kill you than snake yeah. spiders are. Interesting. What throughout the course of um, learning and writing and crafting your work, what has been the most eye-opening to you about our origins, would you say? Well, I guess what was eye-opening to me is just the amazing role that our sociality played. And so if you look at our evolutionary history and you track the first three million years, you see a, a gain in brain power of about 75 grams. You know, we, we go from about 375 gram brain of a chimpanzee to about a 450 gram brain of an Australopithecus. Mm -hmm. That's barely any change in 3 million years. And then suddenly it just takes off and the curve really goes. And a million years later, now we've got an 800, 900 gram brain. And then we get to a million years after that and we, we're starting to look like us. So the you know, scholars have wondered for a long time about what that what caused that. And, and of course, we don't know exactly, but it fits really, really well with the sociality that we would have evolved once we became bipedal and could protect ourselves in the savannah. And of course, once you're a social being, once you're cooperative, now you can leverage groups to be much more powerful than they ever were in the past. And so for me, what's interesting is that it was really our coming together to become cooperative and sociable with each other that then allowed us to become so incredibly smart, which I hadn't really given any thought to and prior to working on this problem. Yeah, that's an interesting sort of self-fulfilling relationship in that way. Yeah. And I love how your area of intrigue and uh, investigation is somewhat different than the typical thing you might learn in a class where, it, you know, at a basic level, the anatomical evolution, you kind of tackle the behavioral in that sense, when you analyze complex things like the relationship between sociality and growing uh, brain size, how are you able to make deductions about behavior when there's so little evidence left behind? You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of the question. So what things, you know, what's an example of things that, you know, something that would stick out that's evidence left behind that you can then use to unravel some sort of truth about behavioral change? Well, there's two kinds of answers to that. The first requires a lot of speculation. So we, this, this is my best guess, uh, not just mine, lots of people, we don't know. And that would be, let's take a look at Australopithecus. So we know that by three and a half, by three million years ago, we know that they were completely bipedal. In fact, I think it's 3.6 million years ago. And we know that from two things, both the, the way when we find the, the um, fossilized remains, we can see the way the head sits on the neck, suggests mm -hmm. an animal that stands up straight. And we can also see the way the knees can lock. A chimpanzee's can't, knees can't lock, you know, it's down on all fours. And we also have, out of 
pure good luck, footprints in volcanic ash that hadn't dried when they walked through it. And so we can see from those footprints. That must that have hurt. It, well, that no, must it would have, have hurt been a little bit. <laughs> No, it would have been cool by the time they walked on it, and then it would have solidified over time, probably with rain turning into cement. That's mm -hmm. my guess. I don't think they would have walked through it if it was still hot, <laughs> but um, because there's little little ones even walking through it. But what you can see is um, they have a foot strike that's just like ours. And so when you computer model a chimp's foot strike and our foot strike and the footprint it leaves behind in soft clay, you can see that it's very different from... A chimp looks nothing like ours, oh. and Australopithecus looks just like us. So now we know those are nice pieces of behavioral inf inference we can make from the body and from the footprint. And then the inference that I draw from that is, well, all right, once they got upright, their muscularity shifted to become lateral rather than vertical to climb trees all the time. And that enabled them to rotate their hips and waist better, which enabled them to throw stones, which is the invention of the capacity to kill at a distance. Mm. Now, we have no idea if Australopithecines ever threw stones in order to protect themselves. There's not one shred of evidence that they did, but we can see in their flexibility of their hand and wrist that they could have. We can see in the flexibility of their shoulder that they could have. And we also see that this is when our brain power started to take off. So it strikes me as the time where they became cooperative with each other. And that cooperation allowed them to protect themselves, because previously, they would have gained very little by cooperating. You know, a lion attacks you on the savanna, you and I could cooperate till the cows come home, we're still lion food. <laughs> but um, if we can throw rocks and prevent the lion from ever getting to us, well, that's a very different ball game. And so that kind of cooperation would have really helped. So that's an example of evidence where we, we don't really know. We're, it's a huge inference and a huge leap, but it stands to reason that it could have happened that way. Now, in contrast, we have more recent data where, for example, we look at the Oldowan tools that our Homo habilis ancestors created, and then the Acheulean tools that our Homo erectus ancestors created about a million years later. And we can see that in the former case, over 2 million years ago, those older wand tools were never carried any great distance from where they're quarried and made. We can match the rock and say, oh, look, it was made right here, and there it lies 100 yards away. Mm -hmm. Whereas with an Acheulean tool, we can match the rock and say, oh, that was quarried five miles away or 20 miles away, which, which suggests that for the first time, our ancestors thought, boy, this sucker will be useful to me again in the future. I'm going to bring it with me rather than I'm going to create it, I'm going to use it, and I, it I can't even imagine ever wanting it again, and I toss it away, which is what a chimp would do, and what, to the best of our knowledge, Homo habilis would have done. Yeah, that, and that's a fascinating piece. Not not only the development there of sort of the um, the, the movement uh, with lateral musculature and being able to stand up and and throw, but also the idea of uh, development of um, delayed gratification and building uh, towards something in the future. Would that be um, something that would be passed down genetically or more orally where, or maybe this might be a hard one, I guess, to be able to, you know, infer off of this, but like, would that be, yeah, would that be once you've learned to do it, it's kind of a uh, genetic thing or is it just, you know, you figured this out. So you tell me, then I tell my offspring, right. then they tell their offspring. Right. Well, it's a bit of both. So the, a chimpanzee cannot envision a world that contains unfelt needs. And so it can think toward the future, but only the immediate, immediate future that matches the present. I'm hungry now. I need to find a way to go get food. And so a chimp will go, oh, I'm hungry. There's a termite mound over there. I'll go over to this branch. I'll strip a, a I'll go over this bush, I'll strip a branch off, pull off the leaves and stick it in the termite mount and knead it. So it's a multi-step process that it knows to engage in because it's hungry right now and wants to work its way toward getting that food. But when it's done doing that, it can't imagine it'll ever be hungry again, which is so counterintuitive for us as humans, because we know full well, I'm going to be hungry at breakfast, I'll be hungry again at lunch, I'll be hungry again at dinner. And we do experiments in the lab where we give them as much food as they want um, but we only give to them once a day. Now that gives the animal the capacity to store the food in a little cubby in the corner for when he gets hungry for a snack, which any human being would do. A four-year-old kid would do that. A chimp can't do that. It can't envision, once it's done eating, it can't envision it'll ever be hungry again, despite the obviousness of that. And so it can't delay gratification for a future that it can't envision. Mm -hmm. and, and so let me give you my example, my, my favorite experiment where they looked at this. So this is work by John Redshaw and Thomas Sudendorf. And what they do is they 
they have this um, treat, like it might be a grape or something like that, and they drop it down the top of a pipe, and the pipe goes down in one tube and then splits into two. So you can't tell, is it going to fall to the left or to the right? And when they put a two-year-old kid at the bottom of that, the kid will put out one hand, and then if he catches it, it'll stay on the same side, and if he doesn't catch it, it'll switch sides, but it doesn't ever <laughs> occur to a two-year-old to put out both hands and just stop it. <laughs> Yeah. By the time a kid gets to four years old, though, they can imagine mutually contradictory futures. It could go left, but it could go right. And so I need to be prepared for both. So a four-year-old child can do that. A chimpanzee can never figure that out. It cannot envision mutually contradictory futures. And so if you can't do that, what's the point of delaying gratification? What's the point of trying to do any of these other things? So once you have that capacity, well, now your parents are constantly trying to help you use it. Okay, let's not eat our dessert now. We'll we'll go do the park first, or you know whatever. We try to delay gratification, and we try to teach them how to how to use the capacity that they have for their own good. But you can't teach a chimpanzee or presumably our um, Homo habilis ancestors to do that because they simply didn't have the capacity. Wow, that that's extremely fascinating, and it hits on those limitations. Yeah, that we that we as Homo sapiens and some of our ancestors may have not had. There on that sort of uh, topic right there, I, I've uh, watched a documentary. I, I'm sure you're very familiar with this about a gorilla that learned something like 300 or 500 sign language words to communicate with um, her trainer. Um, and But they figured out, I think, something to the degree of the gorilla couldn't ask questions or something like that. There was a limitation to the cognitive reverie that was that was going to happen. Is that sort of something that just for other you know great apes a gorilla or a chimpanzee whether it's learning that there is two different kind of futures and i might need this or that thing um going forward or whether it's developing certain aspects of language is that something that takes millions of years or is that something that we might be able to figure out in labs or institutes to aid well, along? again it, yeah, again, unfortunately, they don't have the capacity for language as we use it. They've got great capacity for communication, so they can learn a lot of words, but they're missing a number of pieces of the puzzle that would turn that into language. So language allows you to use syntax, and it allows you to change the order of words and the combination of words to mean anything. Mm -hmm. So kill mom means something very different from mom kills, but uh, for a they can't do that. They can't wow. combine, come up with different solutions depending on as a function of how you use the words. That's problem one. Problem two, with regard to asking questions, is that one of the things that makes human unique is our fundamental interest in the contents of each other's minds. We're constantly want to know, wanting to know what others are thinking, and we're constantly wanting others to know what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an evolved trait that comes about because once we start cooperating and working in groups, and then once our cognitive abilities start to increase, well, a group is only effective if it all is on the same page. And so if you and I see somebody coming over the horizon and you think they're an opportunity and I think they're a threat, you, we, you and I might as well not be in a group because we're not going to act in a coordinated way. But if we can quickly come to a decision, threat versus opportunity, by discussing what's in our mind, then we know that we're on the same page and we can deal with it more effectively, even if we're wrong, even if we come to the wrong choice, at least we're acting as a group. And chimpanzees and gorillas, they don't do that. They can't coordinate their group activities in that kind of way. So they, they're not interested in the contents of each other's mind. They don't have theory of mind, so they're not even aware that the contents might differ. Right? I know that you, what you think and, and what your preferences are aren't the same as mine, but a small child doesn't know that, and nor does a gorilla or a chimp. And so there's a number of stumbling blocks in the way between them using language in the kinds of ways that you and I would, and you know, beyond just teaching them, the, the mental capacities, the building blocks aren't in place. Yeah, I know some homo sapiens that are far more interested than others about the contents of other people's brains. Very, yeah. very nosy, some, some people. Um, <laughs> what, what, you know, you talk about this, you know, a group coming over the hill. One of the most fascinating things I found in researching you and different uh, works you've been involved with was you, I think on one interview, you, you cited that um, if you compare, you know, within your in-group, the violence of that chimpanzees do versus humans, they're, they're doing far more. But if you look at the um, tribal violence that we might do against one group, um, we're much more similar to the amount of violence that chimpanzees yeah. are doing to other groups. And I'd be curious to hear you kind of expand on that, because I think that's a fascinating little um, fact right there. 
It is a super interesting point. This is Richard Wrangham's observation. He's an anthropologist at Harvard. And he pointed out that chimpanzees are wildly violent within their groups compared to us, like 500 times as violent if you look at hunter-gatherers where there's no police. And therefore, if I'm pissed at you, I can just beat you up. <laughs> versus, you know, in our society, we're all then get us, um, you know, a, a charged with assault. Um, so we looked at hunter-gatherer societies versus chimp societies, and they're way more violent. But then he looked at int intergroup violence and it was a one-to-one -one ratio and so the question is well why would that be why would we have been sort of domesticated with the way we treat each other within our groups but not with the way we treat each other between groups and again we can only speculate but the answer seems to be the case if you look at the history of human violence that once human beings um started to be able to envision the future once they developed division of labor once they became oriented toward the contents of each other's minds so they're all on the same page so the groups could act together then the greatest threats to our ancestors were no longer the big predators on the savanna that had originally been an enormous threat the lions the um, leopards and even the saber-toothed cats those animals don't matter anymore because a group of humans can kill all of them even mastodons which are enormous we ate those for dinner they didn't eat us mm -hmm. and so it's our group coordination that makes us so effective but what that also means is that the biggest threat to us is other groups of humans who can also coordinate their group and might want to take what we have and so we evolved to become much friendlier to other members of our group in order to we all want to get along together we all want to be a tight unit but we did not evolve to be friendly toward other groups and in fact if you look at the history of morality and and what groups regard as moral so for example there's a few universal moral rules the golden rule is a good example mm -hmm. do unto others as you'd have them do unto you in the hunter-gatherer societies they don't apply to members of other groups they only apply to members of your own group it's perfectly moral to kill or torture or whatever a member of another group even though it would be wildly immoral to do that to a member of your own group mm -hmm. On that point, with the cooperation versus a threat, Neanderthals, of course, especially someone like me with a European background, you know, I have a certain percentage of Neanderthal in myself. Um, so obviously there was inbreeding, but there, with the various theories going on, there is, of course, the idea that Homo sapiens sort of killed the Neanderthals off at some point. Does that suggest that maybe the Neanderthals didn't, as a species, have that capacity to view other groups or other people as having the uh, a, a worthwhile uh, brain or mental state to be investigating? Or do you think that they probably did have that capacity where they were interested in that cooperation? Because I know they were in smaller groups, but you know, groups nonetheless. Yeah, so unfortunately, it's a great question, but unfortunately, we just don't know. Um, the Neanderthals, you know, so if we look at, if we think about Neanderthals, they're basically our cousins. So Homo erectus leaves Africa and colonizes Europe and Asia, and then continues to evolve in the same way outside of Africa that we evolve inside Africa. And of course, there's also multiple migrations out of Africa of our then more recent ancestors. And all those cousins of ours who left before we did mm. they um they evolve into neanderthals in europe and denisovans and europe and asia and denisovans out in the right hand side of asia to the best that we know in fact there was a very recent discovery in the last few weeks it was reported of a denisovan tooth in a in a cave in laos so we wow. now know that denisovans go all the way from siberia um down to the bottom corner of Southeast Asia, which makes perfect sense because we also see Denisovan DNA in um, Pacific Islanders, in Papua New Guinea and places like that. So um, there are these sort of, and, and we also know the Denisovans and Neanderthals interbred. So we have these um, archaic cousins who are evolving outside of Africa, just like we're evolving inside. But of course, it's colder outside of Africa than it is inside Africa. And therefore, they're heavier set than we are, particularly with the ice ages that were existing at the time. Now, maybe their physiology, by virtue of just being heavy set, they just weren't as well adapted when the glaciers started to melt. Maybe that's all it was. Maybe we were better organized than, we, than they were. Maybe we gave them diseases that we had sort of evolved immunity to and they hadn't. You know, there's a we know we were having sex with them because we know both you and I have their um, DNA in us. And um, to the best of our knowledge, there's no evidence that um, that African-Americans or, or other people from Africa have um, Neanderthal DNA. So it doesn't look like the Neanderthals ever went back into Africa. And of course, if you stayed in Africa, therefore that, that was your, that prevented you from interbreeding with them. Um, so it's, the, we, we could have killed them off on purpose after 
getting fond of them and, and sleeping with them. We could have um, given them diseases. We could have outcompeted them for the same resources that they were competing for. Um, or maybe there's a fundamental flaw in their, in their social structure that just made them less effective than we are. But they appear to be every bit as smart as we were. They appear to have a lot of traditions that we have. Um, we don't know if they could you know, if they could communicate like we can, and maybe that was a problem that our, our language skills were way better. It, it's, these are great questions. We just don't know the answer. What was the, if, you know, traceable, at what, at what point did we sort of break off, you know, with Homo erectus as the common ancestor between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens? Was there a reason or a, a specific gene or trait that was the, the first point at which we can start to identify a difference between the Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens? Did they break off at the same time? And, and, and why was there that difference? So the, remember there's continuing migrations out of Africa. And so, you know, if you're, uh, if you're one of our ancestors, you're this bipedal, clever, not quite as clever as we are, but awfully clever animal. Yeah. And, and you, you notice that there's this land bridge up there on the upper right-hand corner, and, and maybe the guys behind you are mean, and they're kicking you out, or maybe you're just curious what's over the next horizon, or you're hungry, and you're hunting something. And so naturally, humans migrate out. And there's been multiple migrations of our pre-human ancestors, our Homo erectus ancestors. The, those started at least 1.7 million years ago, but they continued regularly throughout time. And every time they continued, you, it's a pretty safe bet that the ancestors who were leaving Africa were interbreeding with those who were already out. But the ones who are already out are heavier set and more adapted for cold. And so those of us who are leaving, we're going to have to have good strategies in place to protect ourselves in ways that they already know how to do when they get out there. The um, I, I could easily be wrong about this, but my memory is that the common ancestor of Neanderthals and us is less than a million years ago. It's more like three quarters of a million. But but I, I could easily be getting that number wrong. I tend to forget these numbers and I'm often often I'm often incorrect by orders of magnitude. But again, it would have been basically a Homo erectus ancestor who went out, who they then now are, are adapting to an environment that's much colder than the environment that we're adapting to, which is interesting. It didn't make them any smarter than we are. They all we all got smarter, both inside and outside of Africa, but they got these big heavy bodies that Neanderthals have, and we have these more gracile, flexible, smaller bodies that are better for um, shedding heat than theirs because shedding heat was not their problem. Mm. And so it's really the environment that's making us different. It's the you're adapting to a cold environment or, or you're adapting to a warm one. What um, were the or what was the social relationships and social structures like within early Homo sapien groups in terms of um, the ways that uh, men and women interacted, the way that maybe age was represented? How much do we know about that, and and what could you tell me? So. We know that, um, for example, that our, our chimpanzee cousins and our baboon distant cousins and stuff, they all have procedures in place where one sex or the other tends to leave at adolescence. So to avoid in, inbreeding. Mm -hmm. And so so animals shift groups, they become interested in another group and they sort of go off and, and establish themselves in a new group um, sometimes the males, sometimes the females, just in order, because those who did that were more successful because they didn't accidentally breed with their siblings. Mm -hmm. um, human beings don't do that. It's an interesting feature of us that we've got these much more flexible groups where sometimes people leave, but often nobody does. Mm -hmm. um, so you can easily imagine a world where we had to be a little smarter and we had to understand who's family and who's not so that we could avoid a problem that they had just a simple behavioral strategy for avoiding. Um, that's one issue. The um, As far as what was the group size and, and how did they interact with each other, we don't have good data on that because you need to find everyone together. And, right. and that means it was a catastrophe, right? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen very often. But what we, what we can do is we can look at hunter-gatherers and say, well, what size groups do they tend to live in? Um, how do they tend to interact with each other? These, you know, these immediate, what we call immediate return hunter-gatherers, people who kill today what they eat today. And they still do exist on this planet in a few places. And when we look at their social structures, they're often very similar to each other, even when they're genetically very distinct from each other, and even when they live very far, great distances from each other. And that gives us a little bit more confidence that that's probably what our ancestors were doing. And if that's the case, then we can say, well, they were, they probably were more egalitarian, sex-wise and age-wise and all the other variables. 
because they were group decision makers without a distinct leader or dictator. They were, you know, if you try to tell me what to do and I don't want to do it, I can just leave and join the different group. So right. they didn't wield power over each other in the same way that we do now, where we're locked to a time and place because we own a house or a farm or live in a city or whatever the case might be. That's fascinating that that the, those power structures would be less of a factor when you're in yeah. that kind of a scenario. That is, yeah, it's very interesting. I, and I, I'm glad you brought up too that there are certain um, people around the world that can give us some sort of insights into what our you know ancestral background might be, the Hadza or other groups. Is there is, is there a sort of an ethical <clears throat> or legal discussion that goes on within your field when you want to learn more from those tribes? I know in um, places like uh, Brazil, there's even some tribes that are said to be uncontacted. Um, is there what what it, what sort of the the way that that's navigated, and how do we best do you think or propose get the optimal information without maybe disturbing, you know, with exposing to diseases, all these yeah. all these things. Yeah, these are great questions. It's super difficult and there's no agreement on it. So we anthropologists try really hard to avoid making the people sick that they visit. Um, there's a lot of catastrophes in the past that were unintentional, of course, because you're visiting somebody who's pre-contact and you don't realize you've got what for you is a trivial flu, but that's going to kill half the people who live there. Um, and of course, it goes the other way. You rock up as an anthropologist and immediately get a disease that that's a no big deal for them, but but drops you in your tracks. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that happens a lot. And so um, the consequence of this is that we we try to be super careful. If there's uncontacted tribes, people now, we know better than to contact them. We leave them alone unless mm. they come in and they say, gee, yeah, there's this fancy looking city thing over here. I'd like to see like what that's all about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, you know, the thing is that we, we often romanticize the past and we say, boy, that was this beautiful existence. And in some ways it is a beautiful existence. Mm -hmm. They feel very connected to each other. They, everybody, it's, it's the original communist society from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs, right? And so they look out for each other in a way that modern humans often don't. But they also live on the edge of starvation. They live in pre-medical societies where they can get sick and die from lots of things that are no big deal for us. They're really good at knowing what plants can help them, but there's often not the right plants around that could do you any good. You know, the list kind of goes on. And so I'm a big believer in letting people vote with their feet. And if they don't want to be a hunter-gatherer anymore, by all means, you know, kind of come join everybody else. But if they do want to be a hunter-gatherer, and often they do, tons and tons of these people see exactly what our lives are like. And they're like, you know, that doesn't interest me at all. And there's even lots of cases of, of throughout the last several hundred years of people getting, um, uh, you know, kidnapped by one of these groups. And then um, they, they get taken away and then they get refound by their family and after a little while with their family they go you know it's been lovely seeing you again but i'm gone oh and my instead goodness of, yeah instead of wanting to live in the world you and i live in they want to go back to the world that they were stolen into that's wild that's like a disney movie or something yeah it that's is like a disney movie yeah, it's a trip <laughs> oh my goodness and what have we been able to pick up from tribes that are living closer to what we believe like early homo sapiens would like you know what what have we learned from them well, there's, a, there's some really interesting cross group similarities that, that you, you can basically see in all these groups. And whenever you see something in one human group, but not others, it's super interesting. But we don't know if that's just something somebody came up with in that particular group that may or may not even be a good idea, right? Um, because groups, all humans tend to do things that are clever and all humans tend to do things that are not so clever. Um, and so the, you know that if you, the more you do clever things, the better your group is going to survive, but all groups can sustain a certain amount of not very clever and still do all right. And so what we look for are those universalities. And there are some really interesting universalities. Um, some of them we don't fully understand, like the fact that women always do the cooking. That doesn't make any sense. Why would that be universal that women cook? Um, Mm. There must be a reason for that, but who knows what it might be. Uh, other universalities make perfect sense. So, for example, there's no such the, there's such a thing as private property, but not in the sense that we think about it. And so, if you own if if you own two of those plaid shirts, well, now I have a perfect right to ask you for one of them yeah. because you don't need to, right? right? And so, whenever there's any anything that approximates a surplus, it's a 
everybody owns it, no matter who made it. Even though you put in the hard yards to, to make that shirt, it's, you, it's an extra, you don't need it. And so I can ask. And so there's universal sharing. And that makes sense. It's kind of an insurance policy. If you think about the fact that um, people are living right on the edge of starvation all the time. And if you think about the fact that most big game hunts are going to fail, well, then you want to know that it's just as long as somebody succeeds, we all have something to eat. And so if there's a big game hunt that succeeds in every one of these societies, people share the they, they share the proceeds. Now, the rules differ dramatically about how they're shared. Sometimes it's whoever's arrow hit it, and they all trade arrows in the morning. Some, it, there's a lot of rules of who divides it up. But in the end, it's always going to get divided up, and it's always going to get handed out. Because that way, you know, even if I don't have any, if I don't kill anything today, but you do, we're both going to go home, go to bed with something to eat tonight. Wow, yeah, universal sharing, that, that makes tons of sense. And on, on that idea of you know, edge of starvation, what can we learn from our ancestors about our own dietary needs of the way we function? I've always thought it was interesting The, you know, I, I go through my life, like most people, what, three meals a day, that's the idea. And I get very used to it. And when I don't have that, you know, when I miss this or that meal, or I don't eat till dinner, I feel very hungry. But then I recognized through, I think I, I did like a three day fast or something. I know many people have done much longer ones. I said, wow, there's sort of these peaks and the hunger that kind of come and go away. And I imagine, you know, my mom was worried about me or something. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure our ancestors and our were biologically built to be able to go like a good amount of time without eating. So there's certain things that we've almost lost in that way. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on you know, the, our ability to endure fasting, but also maybe what sort of dietary things like a surplus of salty foods and stuff like that, what has changed? And is there any benefits do you think to returning to certain traditions? Yeah, that's a great question. There are lots of differences between the ways we eat now and the ways we ate then. So to take one example, um, we have Whenever we sit down for a meal now, particularly for dinner, but for most meals, we have a, a wide variety of foods on our plate. We might have four different um, food options, or we might have four different courses. We might have, we're eating lots of different things. Our ancestors didn't do that. They, if, if you came home from camp and you, you don't say what's for dinner tonight, because there's a big giraffe lying there, you know, you're eating giraffe. <laughs> and so, and, and if you're, um, you know, the, the men were off trying to kill big things and the women were digging up roots and stuff like that. So maybe there'd be berries, maybe there'd be roots, but usually one or the other, because it's all seasonal. And then on top of that, there'd be hopefully some large meat product that somebody brought in. Now, nobody in our, there's not a single hunter gatherer who's a vegetarian. That's, that's a, a privilege that you can be a vegetarian in a world where we're so, where we have so much food available that you can get your necessary nutrients without eating meat. Mm -hmm. But our ancestors couldn't do that because meat is so much more calorically dense. And so one of the key issues is you think about the fact, all right, well, why does variety matter? It turns out that variety matters a lot because variety is part of what drives our appetite. One of the things that we do as humans is when we're, when we're not going to get any more nutrients out of a giraffe because we've now eaten plenty of giraffe, we're just not hungry anymore. But if you then presented me with a cherry pie, I would be hungry again. And so it's the same kind of feeling you go when you're out to dinner at a nice restaurant and you're completely full. And then they go, would you like to see the dessert menu? And the last thing you want is more food, but you're like, oh, actually, I think I could do that. It's because it's different. And so our ancestors never struggled to with obesity. All they struggle with is potentially starving. And so they didn't evolve good mechanisms to stop themselves from eating. But one of the key mechanisms that they did evolve was I, I won't gain anything by eating more of that. We don't use, we don't rely on that mechanism anymore because we we have so much variety on our plate at any one time. And so one of the lessons is that if you do, if you are trying to lose weight, a great way to do it is to decrease the variety on your plate. Now you don't want to do that across your lifespan, like stop eating, you'll get scurvy, you know, if you stop eating fruits and veg, that kind of thing. But you do want to do it in the context of any one meal. So if you, if you have only one or two foods at most on your plate at any one meal, it's a lot easier to stop eating earlier. That's a good example. Mm. Now, 
you raised the point about intermittent fasting. That's a, it was a, a way of life for our ancestors. They, they were in the no choice condition, right? They didn't always get something to eat. Yeah. The downside of that though, is that we also know very clearly now that our bodies responded to that. When we stop eating, it slows our metabolism down, especially if we stop eating over a long period of time, because it, it says, uh oh, it looks like Bill's in a time of famine. I better slow his metabolism down so he doesn't start to death. The problem is that there's good evidence that that, that doesn't rebound for a very long period of time. And so part of the reason that when people diet and then gain the weight back is that they can pre-diet, let's say that a person's metabolism is burning um, 1800 calories a day. Well, post-diet, their metabolism is only burning 1600 calories a day. And they'll stay that way for months, if not years. And so eating the same amount of food that didn't cause them to lose, to gain weight pre-diet will actually cause them to lose weight post-diet because their body thought that they were in a state of famine. And it wisely slowed down their metabolism in order to make sure they survived it not knowing that you're doing it to yourself on purpose wow that's crazy and it does make sense you got uh, most extreme example is like that show the biggest loser where it was this yeah. contest and people would lose a crazy they make crazy transformations lose like 170 pounds and then 60 minutes or whoever came back and did a little show on it and they said most of these people gained the weight back and that yeah. does make sense that if your body thinks you're in a famine, you're going to hold on to energy and not expend it. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, the greatest, the biggest loser is a great example because they actually went in and, and in one of the seasons, I don't remember which one it was anymore. They measured their metabolic rate, which you can do. It's expensive, but you can do it. It's something like double marked water, some crazy chemistry technique. And it's expensive, but it can be done. And they did it for all the contestants at the beginning of the season before they started to lose weight. And every single one of them, their metabolism slowed down dramatically. And then you could see the consequence of how few, how many fewer calories they burned and them all gaining weight right back. With the exception, there was one person who must have had an iron will because he just continued starving himself forever, despite the fact that his metabolism was slowed down and he never gained the weight back, but every other contestant did. Yeah, it's interesting you say none of our ancestors struggled with obesity i would love to see if there was just like one fat australopithecus and just like everyone hated him he's just like the one guy <laughs> that shoot the arrow or something like that um i actually um threw the javelin in college for two years albeit not very well i was not uh, some tip-top college athlete but i was curious was that ever i mean that's always in the depictions was that ever a legitimate tool that was useful some some sort of a spear like object oh yeah so if you watch um i i do some work with the anandiliaqua people in northern australia and you know i throw a rock perfectly well um but if you watch an An anandiliaqua person throw a spear you're like wow that is impressive because they're launching this thing at enormous velocity and incredible accuracy. I'm throwing this thing and it's not even necessarily staying point forward and it's hitting our side in the wrong spot, but they can perforate a kangaroo at a great distance. And so that that's a, a perfect example of throwing, you know, it was, a, it was a series of processes. Probably it was throwing stones first. And we know that lots of societies threw stones and then it would have been throwing sharpened um, sharpened sticks, really, just a, a piece of wood to sharpen on the end. And then eventually we learned as Homo sapiens, we learned to haft these things and put their own point on them. And of course, invention of bow and arrow and all that made us much more effective. But throwing spears is still super important in, in most um, ancestral society, in most hunter gatherer societies. Mm. And it makes sense, too, that they would have this elevated skill and ability to throw it. Um, for instance, I know in the javelin at a professional level, um, you know, it was des designed to be thrown, um, you know, somewhat in a challenging way. And then it got too dangerous where people were throwing about 323 feet. You could get hit on the other side of the stadium if you were the yeah. camera guy. So now it's balanced out. There's uh, the IAAF, which is the governing body of track and field, has weight distribution rules for the javelin. So, for instance, the javelin my dad threw in high school was different than the one I threw because it had to be balanced so that to make it more challenging. But if you were yeah. allowed to make a spear that was perfect for your uses and perfect for not only distance, but probably more so control. I can only imagine how skilled someone could get at throwing that type, type of an object. 
Yeah, so they have the huge advantage of practicing all the time and no rules saying you can't design it this way because it's going to go too far and kill a cameraman. They have the downside that they don't have our modern tech that allows us to machine hone a perfect javelin. So if they could get their hands on your father's javelin, they would probably do a much better job out there perforating yeah. cankers. But they would an awfully fine job just with, this, with the branches that they carved themselves. How do you respond to the you know assessments or the way people maybe label chimpanzees and i know it was um you know within you know the span of maybe one lifetime that we saw the tools that chimpanzees were using when we really investigated maybe i'm wrong and that i'm not really <clears throat> you know in the field no, you're like right you are, but okay you're right. yeah so it's so yeah we figured out that they were using tools would you you know what how would you assess that and would you say that that puts them at a certain point in evolution or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on uh, where chimpanzees are at with tools? So chimpanzees make tools in a way that's more sophisticated than most other animals, but not all other animals. And so, you know, Bert's nest is a tool, right? Mm -hmm. It's a tool for keeping the eggs from falling out of the, um, the branch. On the other hand, the bird does it in a stereotyped way. It doesn't think it through in the way you and I would if we were to build a nest. A chimpanzee, on the other hand, thinks it through and learns how to do it. It's not just this inborn stereotypic knowledge. Um, but the problem is that what chimpanzees lack in their tool making and tool use abilities is instruction. And so every chimpanzee starts at ground zero in the grand tool making scheme of life. And so their, their parents don't have theory of mind and they can't say, uh, no, little Jimmy, you're holding that wrong. Let me help you with that. Um, all they can do is watch and, and be kind of mystified why the kid's so poor at it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, human beings, not only can we can teach our children to do things. And so what, what we know how to do, we can quickly inculcate in them and they don't start at ground zero. But secondarily, because human culture is cumulative, because we can write things down and talk about things in a way that chimpanzees can't, we can all come to an agreement on the best way to do things. And that agreement can improve over the generations. They can't do any of that. And so a chimpanzee will break uh, nuts on a rock by hitting it with another rock or hitting it with a stick, depending on where they live and, and what the norms are in their, in their culture, so to speak. But it's an awfully simple thing that they're doing. It takes them years and years to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't get that much chance to do it anyway, because the nuts are only right for a certain period of time. So it's a little bit like trying to learn to throw a javelin. By every March, you have some javelins lying around and you get to throw them. And then somebody takes them away until the following March, right? It would take you a lot longer. And then nobody can teach you. Nobody can show you the proper technique. And so the downside is, although they do use tools, they use them in such an unsophisticated way that... It, it, it makes a difference in their lives, but it doesn't come close to the way we use tools in our life. How are scientific communities able to distinguish between what is a behavior that they cannot sort of teach and what are things that are innate, like a, you know, um, uh, migrating down um, south for the winter and then flying back to Canada, you know, for the, <clears throat> for the, the summertime, you know, what, what, that kind of a migratory pattern, they obviously are far, you know, a Canadian goose is far behind the, the mind of a, a chimpanzee. So how do you distinguish between something that's just sort of an innate animal behavior and what's something that is taught like that? Like a beaver too is kind of a confusing example. Their dam building abilities is, that's sort of an interesting thing. Yeah. So that's a great question. The, the, there's a couple of ways we can tell. So first of all, um, a squirrel will bury nuts even when it's never yet experienced a winter. So it didn't learn, gee, I got awfully hungry last winter. I better bury some nuts so I have more to eat. So now we know that it's an innate ability because it's burying the nuts without ever experiencing the need for them. So that's one, one way we can tell. Another way we can tell is that they, they rely on a set of cues that might be reliable, but that are wildly incomplete. And so my favorite example, and, and those cues prompt them to behave in a certain way. So my favorite example, that is the meerkat. Now meerkats live in the Kalahari. And so they eat and they eat insects. And so one of the insects that's plentiful is a scorpion, which is wildly deadly. So if you're eating something that can kill you, you want to do a good job trying to kill it first, right? And so what meerkats do when they're when their pups are starting to be weaned, they're no longer living off milk, is they, they'll kill the scorpion and bring it to the, the pup dead so this pup can eat it. And then when the pup gets a little older, they'll capture the scorpion, they'll break its stinger off and they'll bring it to the pup live, but of course they can't hurt it. And so the pup learns to you know, tackle the scorpion and kill it 
without any risk. And then when the pups are bigger still, they literally capture a scorpion, bring it home by pinning its stinger so it can't hurt them, and then toss this deadly scorpion to their pups who have to learn how to kill the thing because that's what you got to do if you're going to be a meerkat. Now that looks super thoughtful. It looks like, oh, my pup's ready to be um, fighting a full grown scorpion, you know, with a stinger attached, but it's not. It turns out that when researchers play the sounds that a baby pup makes, then the parents will kill it and throw the dead scorpion to it, even if their pups are adolescents and are ready to kill it. And in contrast, if they play the sound of an adolescent pup, the parents will throw a live scorpion with stinger attached to, to their baby pups who can't possibly contend with it. And so it's, it's not thoughtful at all. It's I hear a certain sound, I behave in a certain way. It's, it's inborn. It looks like it's clever and thoughtful, but once we pull it apart, it's not. And of course, it makes perfect sense because it's computationally cheaper to just go by the sound, which is never wrong. We can mess with it because we're the researchers and we can put a tape recorder in there. But yeah. the, in, in real life, that, that, that cue will be 100% reliable. So why, why, learn, why do anything else? Why not just rely on the cue that always works without any thought at all? And that's how when we see these kinds of behaviors, we can say, oh, here's an animal that's actually planning and thoughtful. And here's an animal that's engaging in what we call stereotyped behavior. It just does X when Y happens. Wow. That's crazy. And, you know, along the, those lines of animals and even switching gears a bit uh, back to explaining our, our ancestors, why was Africa the place where we sort of emerged out of our earliest ancestors? Was there the right conditions? Was that the right geography? Or was that just happened to be the place where life came out of for our very early yeah. ancestors? Yeah, of course, it's hard to know with any certainty. But if you look at us, we're clearly the product, we're the evolved offspring of the great apes and chimpanzees in particular. Our chimp cousins, they've also evolved since we split with them six million years ago. So they're not quite the way they were six million years ago, but we've obviously changed quite a bit more. Now, given that we're the offshoot of chimpanzees and not of elephants or any of other wide variety of animals that were conceivably we could have come from, well, we know we now have to come from wherever chimps are and they live in Africa. And then what makes us come from the region Africa that we did come from is that that's where the rainforest dried out. So a chimpanzee is king of the canopy. It has no reason to want, so to speak, to become us. There's no evolutionary pressure on a chimpanzee to start walking on the ground and then gaining all the qualities that we have. But the chimpanzees who lived on the right side of the Great African Rift Valley, who lived to the east there, they um, the rainforest slowly dried out because of geographic changes as the Africa splitting into two plates and the Somali plate is elevating. And so that elevation caused the trees, the rainforest to dry out and be replaced with wooded areas in savannah. And that forced our ancestors out of the trees. Now, it could have easily been a disaster. They could have got forced out of the trees, eaten, game over. There's chimps on the left side, nobody on the right side, and that's just the way it is. But we got really lucky that some of our ancestors were forced out of the, out of the trees, spent millions of years skulking around the edges, slowly became bipedal, then developed the capacity to protect themselves, then became social in order to use that capacity and cooperate together. And boom, 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 all the pieces of the puzzle went together. Now, there's no magic that it had to happen there, but it was a combination of the right species was already living there. And then the conditions changed in a way that forced that species to evolve. Mm. And in a, a long, going along with those, those factors, those puzzle pieces, when we did socialize, and I know you referenced earlier, we wouldn't exactly know unless there was some sort of a mass disaster that happened all at once. Are there any times where there, you know, was a, a, a mass disaster or a calamity of some sort where we could recognize that whether it was um, Homo erectus or early Homo sapiens, the size of the groups that they were organizing themselves in? Do we have any idea of how big or if it was bigger in some areas and smaller in some areas? We can't, it's, it's very hard for us to tell if we lived in groups of 20 or 50 or 100, although we can again use modern hunter-gatherers to answer that question, but it's easier for us to tell how many total existed in this particular ethnic group in this particular area. And so we know, for example, that there appears to have been a period of drought in Africa that caused um, the extant human groups that did exist to consolidate in a couple of areas that were pretty far apart from each other and then not have almost any contact at all between them. And so the 
the Homo sapiens that were living in the very southern tip of Africa became quite distinct genetically from the Homo sapiens that were living um, in East Africa and elsewhere because the, there were just not as many of them and and famine or, or drought had driven them apart. But of course, droughts end and more people start to, they, they the groups grow again and then they intermingle again. And so the history of humanity is the history of separation and then reconnection mm -hmm. and so the genetic movement is complicated we can use genetic markers to see how many ancestors there were in a particular group because we can look at variability on certain markers that are frequent in an ethnic group but we can't know exactly how they lived there like were they all 100 who we know existed in one spot or were they divided into five groups of 20 each that's very mm -hmm. difficult for us to say because yeah. so long as those five groups of 20 kept intermingling and which human groups do they they're fission fusion groups they they decide to move along and some go left and some go right and then they rejoin friends and that constant intermingling makes it impossible genetically to discriminate and there's no good behavioral evidence for how large the group was interesting and even before getting we have the fossils and we can use the genetic markers and uh, tools of that of that nature how are we able to locate these pieces of evidence these fossils of early humans or is there a way where we can kind of assess i'm, I'm sure in certain places they're okay well they're in this river valley things like that but when we make these new discoveries like you uh mentioned earlier there was um i think it was a D denisovan tooth that was found in some cave is the, or is this typically you know a random hiker comes across these things or is there yeah. good methodologies where archaeologists are able to find, okay, we got to look here and here that this is the conditions that might help us find more evidence? There's both. And so we rely a heck of a lot on the locals knowing that in that cave over there, there's all these bones. And so anthropologists and archaeologists are constantly going, oh, there's bones in that cave? Well, would you mind if we went and took a look? And could you show us? And, and then sometimes the bones are, oh, that's the dog that used to live here um, and not of any archaeological interest. But sometimes we go, the people are good at this. Of course, I couldn't do it. But people who are archaeologists immediately go, wow, that's obviously archaic and, and it has these features that identify it as such and they know what they're looking at. So that's one strategy, just because the locals have gone into the caves just because they're kids and they're exploring or because they like to go there to get out of the bad weather or whatever, they can then tell us these things. The second strategy though, that you also mentioned is that there's areas that we know are gonna be useful. So Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, um, the Leakey family knew, well, these, this, this gorge has all the features. It's exactly where ancient, where humans evolved. And it's all the features where the um, erosion is con it's continuously causing earlier layers to get exposed. And when those earlier layers are exposed, we don't have to dig a 400 foot hole in order to possibly find something. We find something on the ground even sometimes, or very close to the surface. And then there's some very systematic ways of looking at the bend, the bend and curvature of the land by blending geology and archaeology to say, here's a really promising spot. And then they do these digs where, you know, everybody's there with a toothbrush digging, you know, just super duper slowly to find every tiny tidbit that might be there. Interesting. What makes certain fossils preserved and others not? It's just luck. Just you, know, luck. you want, yeah, you want the fossil to be in the jungle, things don't preserve, they just rot. And even the bones won't preserve. But in a dry climate, things will preserve. Now, remember, the, the human beings evolved on the east side of the Rift Valley where it's drier. So we have an advantage that human remains or hominin remains from our ancient ancestors are much more likely to be preserved. The downside though, is that on the left side, on the, on the west of the Rift Valley, it's been jungle forever. And therefore we don't have good, skull, um, good fossilized remnants of the chimpanzees and watching their evolution over the 6 million years. And so we know a lot more about our evolution over the 6 million years than we know about theirs just because as a consequence of the wetness of their environment, they don't preserve. Now, there are some examples of wet environments that preserve. So if you fall into a PD mushy bar on bog and you go underwater and you stay there, sometimes you can be beautifully preserved. But if you're just lying on the floor of the jungle, you're going to be rot, you're going to be beetle food or whoever, centipedes, whoever come along and eat the remains. And then we just got nothing. Yeah. What do you make of books like, I haven't read this, but Sapiens and, you know, the general popularity among the people obviously it's good when everyone's getting educated on where we come from but from a scientific standpoint with your background is that a book that 
you think is a good representation of the, the body of work yeah. out there? So Sapiens is a great book, but remember the author of Sapiens is an historian and not an archaeologist. And so if you want, or an anthropologist. And so it focuses, it's a great book, but it focuses on one aspect of the problem. There's probably no book that, that covers it all, right? Because it, it all is too big. But if you're, you know, if you're interested in, in the archaeological side, that wouldn't be the choice that you that you look at. If you're interested in the evolutionary psychology side, where you're looking at, well, how did our mind likely evolve? That also wouldn't be the right book. There's other books that answer those questions. But if you're interested in what's the broad scope and picture of human history, well, that's a wonderful book yeah. and a great example where he also does compare us to chimpanzees and thinks about the ways that we differ. Yeah. Well, on the topic of just, you know, whether it's sapiens in that sort of a popular sense or a movie like Catching Fire, I'd be curious to hear about your own individual experience on when you were sort of on the biggest scale, not only with your uh, book, but on the Joe Rogan experience, what, what did you take from the reaction from people when you came and spoke about all these scientific topics that typically would be of interest to an academic audience, um, to, a, to a classroom, but maybe would never be seen by millions of people all at once? Yeah, so it's an interesting experience. On the one hand, you've got um, people are very open to it and interested because they don't know that much about it, right? I didn't know that much about it until I took a deep dive into this stuff, even though I was already a psychologist. But then I spent about 10 or 15 years, well, now it's almost 20, trying to really learn this side of the story so I could match the, our current psychology with where we came from. But um, there are people who are very hostile to it. And interestingly, they're hostile from both the left and the right. Mm. And so people on the right are often hostile because they don't like the idea of evolution in the first place. And so if, you're, if you come from a strong religious background, the whole thing is a bit threatening or offensive or you choose your, your descriptor. Um, and so they're often quite negative about it. And I saw, like, you get lots of comments like, oh, yeah, if we evolved, how come there's still chimpanzees? Well, there's a good scientific reason for that. And it's fair enough, they don't know, but they're just obviously being dismissive without learning about it, which is someone's prerogative. On the left, though, you get people who don't like the idea of evolution because they don't like the idea that the mind evolved because that worries them that if the mind is not infinitely plastic, maybe we can't fashion the perfect society. Maybe there will always be differences between men and women. Maybe there will always be um, violence and things like that. And, and, and lots of people on the political left of the spectrum don't like those ideas. And so you get the equal number of insults coming at you from the yeah. other side, <laughs> saying that you're a retrograde or a caveman or that you're trying to justify bad behavior, which of course, yeah. understanding where it comes from is not to justify it, but, but people get those two things confused in their mind wow and that that's very interesting too as a person to be put on that stage and then face that criticism I, and i know people react differently to it what did you make of of joe rogan as a person oh uh, rogan's great he's super interested and so he he just asked the questions that occurred to him and we chatted for a while beforehand, but quite a while afterward, he was just super interested in the topic in general. Um, he's also a lovely guy. So in, in my case on his show, people don't know this, but when I went into to film it, there was a fire all through um, LA and Malibu and wow. we, we almost couldn't get to his studio in, 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 um, the San Fernando Valley, because it, when you drove down the street that it was on, you couldn't take a left turn that was all burning. Now his house is up there where it was all burning. So he'd been moved out of his house into a hotel and the, his house never did end up burning down, but it came close and there were firefighters there and everything. So here's a guy who I'm a nobody. He can easily cancel my, my podcast, but we've scheduled it. And he, he rocks up looking exhausted from obviously being in a hotel with his wife and kids and not being able to get any time to himself, I assume. and and his house is under threat, but he right. came in and we did our three hour um, podcast anyway. So I was very, and he, you can't see this in the podcast because the camera doesn't show up, but he's drinking the largest coffee you've ever seen in your life. And he just keeps hoovering it down the whole time. And by the end of it, he's all energized and ready to go. But in the beginning, he was out of gas. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. That's crazy. That's a very interesting experience. Obviously I think he's fostered just like for me, he's fostered, um, bit of inspiration to to get involved in podcasting yeah. and interviewing and he's he's been a really big deal um is there a, a person or maybe um a book you read or a paper that kind of inspired your interest in evolution 
Look, there's a lot of great books on evolution. Um, and it just depends on how deep of a dive you want to do. And so you can, Steve Pinker has a lovely book. Some of them are quite old now, like The Blank Slate, which is a super important book written about 20 years ago now. Um, David Buss has some really lovely books on it. Those are, they're designed to be very accessible for anybody. You don't have to be an academic to read them. And then you can dive into um, books that are much more focused. And, and sometimes they're, they're, pretty complicated and detailed and sometimes they're not but you can choose almost any topic you want so my colleague Thomas Sudendorf has this wonderful book coming out with John Redshaw and Adam Bully called The Invention of Tomorrow and it's just coming out in the next few weeks which is a really lovely idea of well how did we learn to understand the future and how did we learn to be able to envision a world with unfelt needs and what are the consequences of that and how do we see that both comparing us to chimps and us to children so you can take deeper dives into these very specific topics with huge numbers of books that are out there wow what you know when when you go to investigate topics and i'm sure it's kind of at the front of your head like what are the most contentious areas of argument in your field right now what are you know people that are you know all you know they're smart people but they disagree with each other what what are the main disagreements and you know what what should people be looking out for so you know first of all we all disagree with each other all the time because we're fighting about the details right we often agree on the big picture because that's now well established but the work we're doing right now you know Fosdick has this hypothesis and I think it's the opposite and then sometimes we work together to try to find the answer and sometimes we just argue with each other interminably um I, I'm a big believer in what the what we call adversarial collaborations where you get together design the experiment that'll show you which who's right and who's wrong because then you both agree to an advance that I think science advances really well when we do that but there's some topics that are just contentious I think for ideological reasons that are entirely separate from the science mm -hmm. and probably the biggest one of those right now is the research on sex differences. Mm -hmm. And so we know that there's mental differences between men and women. It doesn't make one side better than the other, but it just means that they're a bit different. And so we know, for example, that in every country on earth, women on average, this doesn't describe every woman, it's just on average, women have are their verbal skills are better than their math quants, math science skills. And on average, men are the opposite. Right. Men's math quant skills are better than their verbal skills. Now, I'm I, that doesn't describe me. My verbal skills are better than my math science skills if I look at these intra-individual scores, but I'm atypical. And well, you know, these are 60-40 splits. They're not 90-10 splits. Mm -hmm. And so lots of people don't like that research though, because they think, well, that just is going to permanently relegate women to second-class citizenship, or it's going to keep them out of the sciences or something, or people are going to use that knowledge to not be willing to have women in their lab or whatever the case might be. And I, I'm, I actually agree with Pinker on this, where he says, look, the, um, the science of sex differences has no bearing on the morality of how you treat somebody. And so if I, if I know that on average women are X and men are Y, that doesn't mean that I should limit any one man or woman in what they can do by virtue of the sex that they happen to belong to. But it also doesn't mean that I need to pretend that they're the same in order to treat them the same. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's a big fight right now. And of course, that fight is made even bigger in the current world we live in by the fact that now increasingly there's lots of people who feel that they're born in the wrong sex and they want to transition to the other sex or they want to they feel like they're neither sex at all and of course that's a perfectly legitimate thing to want to be the problem is that then there, an ideology surrounds it where if if somebody wants to do that we then have to pretend that there are no sex differences well that it doesn't follow there can be huge sex differences but we can still say well you can you have the prerogative to be an exception to that rule because tons of humans are so unfortunately, what happens is ideology gets in, interleaved and infused in the science, and that creates unnecessary fights. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you too saying, like pointing out, because um, for me, I would fit into that where there's the typical, well, men are more interested in things and women are more interested in people. I have a podcast and over the course of 10 months, I've done about like 170 interviews. I'm, I'm very much more interested in people. So, it, but yeah. you're right that there is these scientific foundations that there are on average things that describe um, sex differences and that there's a, you know, these discussions that you would normally be having among just in the academic fields sometimes gets all of a sudden plastered onto a newspaper yeah. article and then 10 other outlets that are looking at that outlet expand it more and it becomes sort of a political firestorm and it it scares people to sort of investigate um in the way where they're solely pursuing the truth when they have to kind of worry about 
well, is this side or that side going to be angry about me for making this sort of a deduction? Yeah, or even investigating the question. And so if you ask, well, why are more people transitioning today than than were 10 years ago? There's only one acceptable answer. And that one acceptable answer is, well, we were not very kind to um, people who felt who, who felt that they were in the wrong body, who felt that they were different sex or felt that they were neither sex, neither sex. And by virtue of the fact that we discriminated against some people didn't come out. Well, undoubtedly, that's true. But it's not 100% clear. That's the whole story. So mm-hmm. it seems to be an important topic that people would want to investigate. But anyone who goes into that is going into a minefield. You know, you have to step very carefully without one side or the other, or sometimes both attacking you for the, the question you're asking or the answer that you find. Right. And when you're even um, a comedian, you know, and co- comedians yeah. on stage telling what are quite literally ascribed to be jokes, they say, this is my stand up special when they're getting attacked. I can only imagine how hard it would be for a person, you know, working on a college university campus or something to be able to go and, and take a stand or, or, or like you said, more even just raise a question. Hey, there needs to be a very complex and thoughtful discussion on a certain topic that you know, does relate to people's personal feelings, but there's still, you know, scientific importance to these questions. Yeah, so I don't know if you saw this, but for example, Princeton just fired one of their professors a few days ago, and they say they fired the person because of a consensual sexual relationship with the student, um, that uh, then it turns out more information came to light, and it was unacceptable, and he was fired, and maybe that's true, but he says he was fired because he, he, wrote an article where he made some complaints that upset some of the students about some of the race relations that were going on on campus. In any one case, it's impossible to know. So Princeton might have done the right thing by firing him for being inappropriate with the student, and they may have done the wrong thing by firing him for holding these attitudes that they happen not to like. But whenever you're doing this kind of scholarship, you're going to look at that guy or and countless others like him and say, hmm, maybe it would be safer if I study the beetle instead of studying this particular problem. Yeah. And in that in that trend too is of just um you know it, it, it's damaging too to future generations when a place that's supposed to be a bastion of free speech and discussion is removed and you can't uh, engage in that anymore that's a very difficult thing um especially um considering i think one thing that i found very admirable about you and researching this was when you went on joe's podcast there was something that you know, you kind of maybe overstated or in retrospect, you said, hey, you know what, maybe I should have put this differently, or I should have considered that. And that was not just like a coffee table discussion that was in front of God knows how many people. But you didn't take it as a personal attack to yourself. You said, I'd like to have the best possible ideas and be able to represent myself the best possible way. And that's something I struggle with as well. When um, to, to be able to accept that. And I think everyone does to a certain extent, but many people begin to embrace I- ideology as, you know, um, a manifestation of their personality or something. And if you yeah. disagree yeah. with that, then it's a personal attack somehow. Yeah. And, and it's super important as a society and even more so as scientists to be able to disagree with each other about anything, because that's how science progresses. You know, every human scientist is deeply flawed. We're all deeply biased. We can't help it. We're just humans. But what makes our, our science work, even though we're biased, is that you don't share my biases. So I publish a paper that's flawed and you attack it. And then you publish papers that's flawed and I attack it. And we continue to hone our way and work toward the truth. And that'll only work if I'm then capable of going, oops, that was my mistake. Thank you for pointing that out and move along but of course human nature is not really good at doing that Mm -hmm. well uh bill i want to thank you so much for your time and i look forward to seeing all the more disagreements and progress that will be made (laughs) by your beautiful mind thank you so much for your valuable time and coming on the young shakespeare podcast thanks dan it's been my pleasure yeah thanks so much to bill von hippel for coming on thanks to everyone who's been listening watching liking subscribing please tune in to the next episode of the podcast and have an amazing day